good morning. Uh, I'm Brad Lander. I'm a member of the New York City Council. It's uh, great to be here live and in person. Now, Matt promised no uh, technical difficulties, but he also promised participatory budgeting with a Brooklyn accent, and I confess I'm from St. Louis. So uh, uh, that does mean the good news is that as a Cardinals fan and not a Yankees fan, I can come to Boston without deep ambivalence. Uh, uh, and I am excited to be here, uh, you know, just steps from the ferment that uh, led to American democracy to talk about some of the practices and learn from you about some of the practices uh, that are on the frontiers of democracy today. Uh, as an elected official uh, dedicated to who really ran for office motivated by new forms of civic engagement, by the idea of giving people a voice uh, in new ways, involving people more deeply as stewards in the public realm, uh, and addressing issues of equity and inclusion, uh, I, we've got a lot to learn together and I'm excited to be here both to present and then to learn from you. Um, well before my election to the City Council, I, I was elected in 2009, uh, I have a 15-year history in community-based organizations and community-based planning, uh, trying to involve people more strongly in the decisions that shape their lives and neighborhoods. For 10 years, I served as the Executive Director of the Fifth Avenue Committee, a community development corporation in Brooklyn, uh, committed not just to creating affordable housing, addressing tenants' rights, and helping people get good jobs, uh, but to really involving people in uh, the situation, the shape of their neighborhood, the shape of their lives, uh, through a range both of forms like uh, limited equity cooperatives in housing, through community-based planning, through community organizing for social change, a broader conversation to have for those interested specifically in community development about the tensions between inclusion and participation and community organizing uh, in that field. Uh, after that, for five years, I directed the Pratt Center for Community Development, uh, which would put me very comfortably in the room with those thinking about sort of what's the, uh, the civic science and practice. It's a think and do tank at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn that supports community-based groups around the city in shaping land use, sustainability, housing, economic development decisions, both to develop their own projects, uh, to contest and negotiate around projects proposed by others, whether private developers or government, and to engage people in organizing for social change on a wider range of land use, housing, economic development, and environmental uh, issues. Um, and in both cases, I will point out, um, both organizations really committed to equity, uh, both in participation, bringing people to the table, but also in outcomes, wanting more affordable housing, better jobs, you know, uh, elevating low-wage work. Sometimes those things go together nicely, uh, and sometimes they don't go together nicely, which is certainly one of the, one of the tensions that I think is worth talking about. Uh, so I ran for city council and was elected in 2009, uh, really with those same goals, trying to think about how to bring those into office, um, and have tried to do uh, a lot of different things in the last two and a half years to bring civic engagement into my representation. I'm one of 51 city council members. It's a big city. I represent about 160,000 people in a set of Brooklyn neighborhoods, uh, diverse, Park Slope, upper middle class, but also Kensington, a large Bangladeshi community, Borough Park, uh, a good chunk of Orthodox Jews, so uh, an interesting and diverse neighborhood. Um, I, I've done a lot of supporting of traditional community organizing since that's where I come from, uh, working with people who are already doing that organizing, trying to find gaps where it wasn't taking place. So we've got a lot of parent leaders in our schools, um, really active in their schools, often with a point of view on broader education issues, but not much way to relate to each other. So that's a place where I've brought people together. And then just supporting existing groups. Um, there's another whole conversation to have about some of the tensions for elected officials who believe in and want to support community organizing about where and what the lines are, since when that just fades into some kind of you know, boss-oriented parochialism uh, you know, isn't always easy to tell. Um, uh, I will say quickly on uh, e-communications, you know, everybody's on Twitter and Facebook. I am still stunned in the end, and everyone tries to raise money uh, with online emails. The number of elected officials who just maintain a good email list uh, and use it to communicate interactively with people via the website is stunningly small to me. Probably the best thing I do, honestly, except for, PB, for participatory budgeting. I've got a list of 20,000 people. I email them, not newsletters, but specific items that are relevant that day, that week, and as often as possible, link it to something else on the web that they can communicate or do. Petitions, yes, but 
we have an interactive website about stalled development sites in the neighborhood where people have had the ability to make change. We've got a shop local section of the website, a community service section of the website. It's really surprisingly easy. It's enormously uh, appreciated by my constituents. And I'm just stunned by how few elected officials, even at that relatively basic level, take what are pretty simple tools uh, you know, they're not collective or deliberative, but they are, anyway. So, um, uh, a lot of that. Um, and then I also am one of the founders in 2010, um, there's a dozen of us, uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the New York City Council Progressive Caucus, uh, which is mostly people focused on uh, creating opportunity on inclusion, on confronting the inequality in, in New York City. Um, and we, uh, we have been a little more focused on sort of substantive equity, trying to pass a living wage law, address the issues of stop and frisk, more than we have on uh, inclusion and process, but we've done a bit of that as well and I think are trying to think of participatory budgeting as part of our effort to do uh, even more of that. One thing I just want to uh, flag there is when we're active as the Progressive Caucus, we, we've got a point of view on issues. We're trying to end the stop and frisk program. And I feel some tension, as I was talking about in my table, prompted by one of the quotes, between setting the table for inclusive process and bringing, mobilizing and working with people with whom I share a point of view. And I mean, you can't not have that tension as a legislator. Um, I think it's valuable to do both, but it's, it's, it, it's fuzzy, and I, I think it's worth doing some uh, reflecting on. Uh, so in that vein and with those goals, I was thrilled to be one of the four city council members who last year for the first time brought participatory budgeting to New York City. Now even bringing it is actually a pretty good inside-outside organizing process. Um, uh, two partner organizations, Community Voices Heard, uh, grassroots group of mostly low-income residents in New York City and the Participatory Budgeting Project, a national organization working on participatory budgeting, uh, brought Alderman Joe Moore, uh, the first elected official in, in the United States to do this in the 49th Ward in Chicago, to New York City for a tour. Um, and they really set me up, right? They organized an accountability session at Pratt Institute where I used to teach and said, oh, Brad, will you come and listen to the presentation and make some remarks afterwards? Uh, you know, and of course the questions were, well, when are we doing this in New York? And uh, so I was sort of stuck and had no choice. And so I dragooned three of my uh, colleagues, two other members of the Progressive Caucus, and one Republican, Eric Ulrich out in Queens is, uh, is a Republican. Uh, we, we did a lot of work to try to make it a bipartisan initiative. And the four of us each agreed uh, to bring participatory budgeting to New York City. Um, for those, you know, for those of you that don't know, you know, participatory budgeting is a process through which community members directly determine how to spend some part of a public budget. Uh, the part we're spending in New York City is pretty small. We've got a $70 billion budget, budget um, about a $30 billion capital budget, and each of us put up $1 million of the small, modest city, uh, city capital discretionary pots that we have, but uh, a big start, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, a million dollars is nothing or it, it's a lot of money. So um, anyway, it's, it's actual decision making. At the end of the day, uh, community members vote and the votes determine what gets funded. So it's not uh, only a consultation process, it really is a direct decision making process. Uh, at best, it's ongoing. You don't just do it as sort of a one time game show uh, contest. It's an annual cycle. And also at best, and I don't think I understood this before starting, it's inclusive and deliberative. As you'll see, I'll go through the process. It's not just, hey, I've got a bunch of, I can't decide between the 10 things that I might fund with this money. You vote. Um, as you'll see, the ideas are brainstormed, developed, researched, put on the ballot by uh, a process of participation. Launched 20 years ago now in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Been done now 3,000 cities around the country, but only in that 49th ward in Chicago. Uh, and so far in the four uh, districts in New York City. There's some uh, Canada and, uh, experiences in North America, and it's growing in, in the United States, but not uh, at all significant yet. Um, you'll, I'll go through the process with some uh, pictures so you can see all this, but just to get a sense of the cycle, you start with neighborhood assemblies where you bring out as many people as you can to identify needs, brainstorm proposals, Delegates, uh, they're not elected, so I don't know that delegate is exactly the right word. It's a self-selecting process where people who would like to then meet in committees and develop those ideas 
um, do so, present those ideas to the community, vote, and then continue to have ongoing uh, implementation. Uh, so it really all starts in the neighborhood assemblies where you work to bring a diverse group of people together, get in small groups, talk about what the issues are. Some interesting tensions there, uh, whether you bring people together you know, or not. We needed to have a, a Bengali language uh, breakout group for the Bangladeshis, but then that doesn't necessarily put people together across groups. Um, the, uh, in the Orthodox community, we knew that there would be this issue of gender segregation and we let people gender self-segregate, which uh, we didn't set it up that way. I would never do that, but we didn't intervene either because we wanted people to come and be comfortable participating. So interesting questions. Um, there were some youth and senior sessions as well to try to get at um, particular issues there. Uh, then, as I mentioned, people sort of volunteered to become budget delegates and did extraordinary work. This was an, another piece that really surprised me. Um, uh, where it became deliberative democracy, where the leadership development took place, where people started having new relationships to a whole range of city agencies. These are the 12 city agencies that delegates in issue committees. The, the neighborhood assemblies were by neighborhood. The delegate committees were then by topic. And so the transportation committee got everybody's transportation ideas from all the different neighborhoods and tried to deal with the New York City Department of Transportation. Uh, and that was a great and complicated and frustrating and wonderful process on both sides. And we had uh, bureaucrats who loved it and bureaucrats who didn't understand it at all. And we had residents who really learned about how government works. And we had residents who just could not understand why the agency couldn't make it possible to do the project that they wanted. So um, those groups then choose uh, what's going to get on the ballot. Um, as you can see, we had a whole lot of ideas, a bunch of eligible projects. The committees had to do a lot of work to research and decide what went on the ballot. Um, uh, we then got to voting. This is a copy of our ballot. You can't see it probably that well, but um, 20 items. A lot of effort to let people know what was on the ballot um, in a few different ways. We did a big neighborhood expo where you could come and talk to the people who had proposed it. They were online. At each voting site, there were books, but this question of education and how to let people know. Um, the voting was extraordinary. This is the Windsor Terrace Kensington Neighborhood Library, at which point there were 100 people in line pretty much throughout the day uh, in a public library that really not even that many people usually go to. So um, uh, it was really a spirit. The voting in particular was sort of a spirit. We did it over a weekend, two days, six different polling sites around the community. Uh, people were out uh, electioneering for the projects that they supported. Um, uh, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a really wonderful process. Seven projects won. Um, I won't go into them except to say the top vote-getting project were some horrific bathrooms in a neighborhood public school right on the edge of the district, um, mostly Latino, low-income. It was not because they electioneered. Um, the other school that won, number four, PS 154 and 130, they won because they electioneered. PS 124 won because the situation that was going on in that school, everybody said this is wrong, and even though it's a little ridiculous that we have to do this and the school system is not, it's the most important item on this list. So that was sort of inspiring. Um, the New York Times did a wonderful piece in which they coined it revolutionary civics in action. I think we can maybe put a question mark after that, but um, <laughs> it was very powerful for sure. Um, in my district, about 2,200, over 2,200 people voted in the four districts in total, over 6,000, more than 250 people served as budget delegates. Um, we had a research partner who did a lot of looking at who participated and who voted. And, um, y y you know, it, you have to really drill down, but a, a lot of people participated who have not participated in any kind of civic activity before. Um, the four districts are very diverse. East Harlem, so mostly Latino and some African American. East Flatbush, overwhelmingly African American and Caribbean. Mine, mostly white and middle class, but diverse. And then Eric Ulrich is out in Queens. So um, really pretty interesting. Um, uh, you know, it is important certainly to be honest about a lot of the challenges. Uh, it is very time intensive. Uh, it takes a lot of time from the staff and you get a ton of people involved as leaders so you're getting time but it, you know, organizing that well takes a lot of time. Uh, making it as inclusive as possible is, is hard work and doesn't always work. 
Um, no one cares about the 39th district. Uh, and so bringing people from Borough Park and Park Slope together, they don't even know where each other are or care anything about each other. And if they do, they look on each other with suspicion. So um, making it inclusive was challenging. Um, a million dollars is not a lot of money to achieve capital projects in New York City, so um, there is certainly some amount of frustration in that people want to do things that are impossible. Um, hard to link, on the one hand, it opens up substantial appetite for democratic participation. People loved it. They really reported, this is restoring my faith in government, I've never felt like such a citizen, I never, and you didn't have to be a citizen to vote, actually, um, I never felt so included. but. It still takes a lot of time just to organize this and get people to understand these issues, much less think about the issues in a complex $70 billion city budget, to link that to other frames for community planning. Like no one said, hey, um, should we put a waste transfer station in our neighborhood because the garbage has to go somewhere. So how to think about broader issues of community planning. Um, and it's, it's fair in that everyone had sort of access to the same amount of money, but it's not necessarily pro-equity um, by itself. You have to do other things. Um, uh, that said, and, um, and I'll end here, um, I, I had high expectations and they were dramatically exceeded. Um, there was really deep, deep participation, both in terms of numbers and in terms of that sort of spiritual sense of, uh, of participating. Many people reported this uh, renewed sense of trust in government. Well, uh, and one thing that I um, also hadn't expected and found so encouraging was I expected a lot of, you know, I've always felt excluded. Thank you for, you know, th this let me uh, feel like I could participate. But the number of people who expressed a deep sense of stewardship, of responsibility for the public realm uh, was very encouraging. People really care about their streets and subways and sidewalks and parks and, um, and we'll act as stewards of them if, if given uh, the opportunities to do so. In a couple of cases, it led to new Friends of Parks groups forming. Um, uh, I think people saw, saw it as both inclusive and efficient, two things which can often be in tension, but the decisions that got made felt good. Uh, and I think people, you know, I think there was a lot of mocking of it at the beginning. One of the 864 proposals was for um, gondolas on the Gowanus Canal, the gondola. <laughs> And so there was a lot of, you know, teasing in the press about all these ideas, but the wacky ideas didn't win. Uh, uh, so um, it pushed both within and across city agencies. It opened a dialogue about neighborhood planning, even if it's hard to figure out how to connect that to participatory process and planning. A lot of new leadership development. Last year, basically, my office, with a few folks who had already done it, ran the process. We opened it up to a neighborhood committee and 25 people have volunteered to be on the organizing committee. Not uncomplicated to figure out all the relationships and who makes decisions in these inside-outside processes, but a lot of people who are eager to do it and in a good dialogue with us. And we just announced earlier this week that four more city council members have agreed to do it, so we're doubling to eight for next year. And I really think there's a lot of places this can go. In the city council, where many more people can do participatory budgeting, in the city council where the institution can see itself much more deeply as a vehicle for civic engagement in all kinds of ways, um, in our parks department, which has had some dialogue and thinking about it, and across the United States and in North America as more and more cities are exploring the possibility of doing it. Um, if you want to um, be in touch with me, uh, my website's at bradlander.com and you can communicate with me through it. Um, if you're interested in really bringing experts to your city, um, uh, the Participatory Budgeting Project, Josh Lerner is, is its director, and I should have uh, put their URL up here, but if you Google Participatory Budgeting Project, um, they are uh, working with both not-for-profit organizations and elected or appointed officials. So you can kind of bring it in from, from either direction and build the partnership from there. Thank you very much.